सच्चिदानंद रूपाय विश्वोत्पत्यादि हेतवे तापत्रय विनाशाय श्री कृष्णाय वयम नुम जन्मादितरतस्ेश्वरा तेने ब्रह्म हृदय आदि कवये मुह्यूर तेजो वारी मृदा यथा विनीम यसर्गो मृषा धाना स्वेन सदा निरस्तुहक सत्यम परम धीमहि धर्म प्रोजित कैटवोत्र परमो निर्मत्सरा सता वेद्यम वास्तव वस्तु शिवदम तापत्रोन्मूलनम श्रीमद्भागवते महामुनिते कि परेश्वर सद्यो हृदयवरुद्यतेकृति शुश्रूषु भीतना With your eyes closed, invoke tapa, evoke shadha. Aryom and greetings from Niagara Falls. In the culture of Sanatana Dharma, there are seven moksha dwara nagaris. These are places, these are cities where the focus is moksha. Those who are more ritualistic in mindset, they feel that if you live and die here, that you will be free here's what they are the first is ayodhya naturally this is significant for bhagwan rama was born there when we studied vedanta and ramayana we had learned how all who lived in ayodhya when bhagwan rama left this world they left too to be with him The second is Mathura where Bhagwan Krishna was born. And you had just heard when he left Mathura all of the people went with him. The third is Haridwara. Haridwara. And why this is significant? Haridwara is a place where maya cannot come imagine bhagwan narayana and bhagavati lakshmi living in, in haridwara and bhagwan narayana leaves home to go to work who does he work with his co-workers devi maya 
But when he goes home, who can't come into that home with him? Davy Davy Maya has to stay outside. <laughs> he has to be with Bhagavati Lakshmi. So Maya cannot enter Haridwara. The fourth, Varanasi, also known as Kashi. The significance here is Bhagavan Shiva speaks and teaches of the glory of Bhagavan Narayana. This is why this is a Moksha Dwara Nagari. If one dies there, it is Bhagavan Shiva who will whisper into your ears so that your last thought is of Bhagavan Narayana. Number five, Kanchipuram. Kanchipuram. The significance here, and this is associated with Sundara Kanda. When we had studied Ramayana, each of these nagaris is associated with a Kanda or section of Ramayana. I'm going through that order right now. The fifth city is associated with Sundara Kanda. What is beautiful about Kanchipuram is that there is a focus on Bhagavan Shiva and Bhagavan Vishnu. And in Sundara Kanda itself, the first half of the Kanda focuses on Bhagavan Shiva, that is Hanumanji. And the second half, focuses on Bhagavan Vishnu, where Vibhishana, who is a devotee of Bhagavan Vishnu, becomes the focus. The sixth, Avantika. Avantika is the sixth Moksha Dwara Nagari. This is where Bhagavan Krishna learned about life. This is where Rishi Sandipani taught Bhagavan Krishna. And for us particularly, such an emphasis on the Guru Shishya Parampara because the greatest contribution of Swami Chinmayananda and Chinmay Mission is Sandipani Sadhanalaya. In reference to Ramayana, in this kanda, Vibhishana Gita is one of the focal points where Bhagavan Rama teaches Vibhishana like Rishi Sandipani as if taught Bhagavan Krishna. And the seventh, Dwaraka. What is unique about Dwaraka or the seventh Kanda of Ramayana, this is when Bhagavan Rama got to be the Raja. This is when Bhagavan Krishna gets to be the Raja. So there's Ram Raja, there's Krishna Raja. This is the seventh of the Moksha Dwara Nagaris. These are not physical places. Many of you are checking off, been there, been there. How come you're not enlightened then? <laughs> They're not physical places. These are metaphysical spaces inside of you. This is a lovely introduction to the completion of our semester because we're going to all of these nuggeties. I hope week after week, month after month, you feel more free. We're going to these nagaris. We are in these nagaris. What are we talking about other than Bhagavan Narayana or Bhagavan Shiva, etc., etc., etc.? You're welcome. You didn't have to pay a single dollar to travel all <laughs> travel all over <laughs> Bharat and get to know the intricacies of all of these most lovely places. In the Purva portion of Bhagavan Krishna's life, when he was a child, you may have noticed that he never used a weapon in terms of putana or shakata asura, etc. 
He just used his own body to correct these asuras. Because the purva part of his life, the focus is madhura, sweetness. Almost like a controlled environment. The uttara, or the later part of, <coughs> of Bhagavan <coughs> Krishna's life, that we're in now. As soon as he came into Mathura, he had to use a weapon. And what this symbolizes is for us to adapt in an uncontrolled environment. I'm not encouraging you to use weapons physically. I'm encouraging you to use weapons metaphysically. Use a planner. Get up earlier. Think before you speak. All of these are the weapons that are needed in an uncontrolled environment. And if you live like that, there will still be sweetness. In our last class, the personality <coughs> that we focused on was Raja Muchukunda. When the devas offered him whatever he wanted, they stipulated, we cannot give you moksha. And there's a deep insight into this. Just like the devas are subject to time, everything other than moksha is subject to time also. Time is one of our greatest fears. In Bhagavad Gita, this is symbolized as death. When you know whatever you're doing with your life, whatever you have with your life, in your life, is subject to time, that is when you shift your worship from the semi semi-gods, that is the devas, to the absolute god, that is Bhagavan Krishna. And this is perfectly shown. When Bhagavan Krishna asks Raja Muchukunda, what do you want? He says, I want that possession that bhaktas depend on. What does a bhakta depend on? Bhakti. A bhakta does not depend on anything but bhakti. This is what Raja Muchukunda wants. He knows this is the end. Bhakti is the ends, the fulfillment. In the next chapter, and I won't focus on this, Raja Muchukunda leaves Bhagavan Krishna and he depends on Bhagavan Krishna as he's going about living his life. He never feels separate from Bhagavan Krishna. Our kata continues. We are in the Tenth section, the fifty second chapter, the thirty first verse, ten fifty two thirty one. Bhagavan Krishna is speaking to a Brahmana. <coughs> this Brahmana is acting like a messenger. I don't see too many smiles, which shows that you have no idea what I'm talking about, which is good. Then this is more exciting. <laughs> so this Brahmana is acting as a messenger. Santushto yarhi varteta Brahmano yena kena chit Ahiyamanasya dharmat Sahyasya kila kama duk this is a powerful verse where Bhagavan Krishna is sharing to this Brahmana. Santushto yarhi varteta. One should be content with whatever comes into their life. This is powerful because this is how we are to live, especially as this course is being completed. Do not get lost in externalizing who a Brahmana is. If you're still doing this, 
And I don't know what has been taught over the last 105 classes. A Brahmana is one who loves Brahman. Brahmano yena kena chit. Such is a Brahmana. That whatever comes, whatever goes, santushtaha. They're content. Why? Where is that contentment coming from? Themselves. How is this possible? Ahiyamana syad dharma. They never make excuses when it comes to their own dharma. No excuses. I had shared with all of you, no annotating, no blaming, no complaining. Sahyastya akila kamaduk. Such a vision, such a lifestyle. They get everything that they need and want. It's like kamaduk lives with them. Any of you who live like this, you would have found all that you want and need in your life has come. In different ways I've shared with you, if you choose peace, what's coming with that? Prosperity. In one of the last scenes, Kala Yavana was burnt up by Raja Muchukunda. Bhagavan Krishna then went back to Mathura and defeated the rest of the Yavanas. Kala Yavana was their leader. He defeated the rest of the Yavanas. Then who came? Jarasandha. He had come 17 times, so he was hoping maybe the 18th time would work. <laughs> when Bhagavan Krishna defeated the Yavanas. He had taken all of the wealth that they had started stealing from Mathura. But Jarasandha came, and when Bhagavan Krishna saw him, he left all of that wealth, and he ran away. So Jarasandha, coming the 18th time, as if worked. Bhagavan Krishna ran to this mountain area. And Jarasandha, so vicious. He lit a fire on the bottom of this mountain. The idea being is that Bhagavan will be burnt out. And Bhagavan Krishna jumped off of the top of that mountain and returned to Dwaraka. And Jarasandha returned to Magadha. Fine. That happened. What next? Some of these details you should know. I'm going to read to you <coughs> in English. Remember, Raja Parikshita is asking Rishi Shuka questions. I don't know exactly how many days have passed. Let's say five days. He only has a couple of more days to live. And Raja Parikshita is not an average seeker. He is well-read. He is knowledgeable. So, <laughs> he says to Rishi Shuka, I have heard that the Lord married Rukmini, the handsome daughter of Bhishmaka, following the Rakshasa form of marriage. <laughs> Such sattvic gossip. I heard this about Bhagavan, about Bhagavan Krishna. <laughs> O thou knower of Brahman, where is the connoisseur who will feel satisfied with and get tired of hearing the accounts of Krishna, which are sanctifying, delightful, and destructive of man's ignorance, and possessed of the quality of ever-renewing novelty? These are two poets sitting with each other and reveling <laughs> in the life and teachings of Bhagavan Krishna. So then Rishi Shuka starts to describe how Balarama got married to Revati. And Bhagavan Krishna is going to get married to Devi 
Rukmini. There's a lot of Bollywood right now, <laughs> and more so in the next class. In the land of Vidarbha, this is essentially near Nagpur. There was a leader, his name is Bhishmaka. Bhishmaka. And his oldest child, his name is Rukmi. And his youngest child's name is Rukmini. Rukmi, Rukmini. Devi Rukmini had heard lots about Bhagavan Krishna. How he ties his dhoti, how he self, <laughs> he's self-trained in music. And she took the sankalpa, she resolved that she will marry him. That she will be with him for the rest of her life. And Bhagavan Krishna also heard lots about Devi Rukmini, how she tied her sari, <laughs> how she was trained in Bharatanatya, <laughs> that she has the most virtues. So he also resolved that he is going to marry her. However, Devi Rukmini's oldest sibling, whose name is Rukmi, he was a close friend of Shishupala. Do you all remember Shishupala? <laughs> He's living in your home right now. <laughs> One of the reasons why Bhagavan Krishna has incarnated is to defeat, to correct Shishupala. So his name is coming back. And Rukmi had made an arrangement for Devi Rukmini, for his sister, to get married to Shishupala in two days. So what did Devi Rukmini do? She called a trusted messenger. And she wrote one of the first love letters in history. <laughs> and she sent this with this messenger. It was a Brahmana. Was a Brahmana. And he went, he went, Dwaraka, Dwaraka. And imagine how he, imagine got, how he got there. He just swim through, through the ocean, the ocean to reach Bhagavan. Now, Bhagavan Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna and this messenger are sitting together. And Bhagavan asks this messenger, what are you doing here? Who swims through the ocean for fun like that? And he gives Bhagavan Krishna Devi Rukmini's love letter, her message. This is known as Rukmini Uvacha. It is verses 37 to 43. Again, we are on chapter 52. There are lovely messages lovely descriptions of how Devi Rukmini knows in detail who Bhagavan Krishna is. And there's so much, I'm not going to summarize that for you. I've given you a reference. Near the end of the letter, she says to Bhagavan Krishna, <coughs> my Swayamvara is about to happen. Swayamvara, she gets to choose who she's going to be married to forever. She says, you come incognito. Come in incognito. And she's so thoughtful. She shares, but I know that you're not going to want to hurt or kill anyone. So instead of coming during the Swayambara, the day before, we are going to go to our family mandir <coughs> and we are going to worship Devi Parvati. You come at that time. And when you come at that time, you can come and take me. That's why earlier, Raja Parikshita said, they got married like Rakshasas. <laughs> Bhagavan Krishna. And you'll find out about that. Bollywood, you have to wait. And she signs off this letter saying that if you don't come, I'm going to engage in tapa, life after life after life, until you are my pati. 
imagine the mumukshutvam that I will only marry you. The Ananya Bhakti. Who is Devi Rukmini? She is Devi Sita. She is Devi Lakshmi. She is born and is living as a princess because Bhagavati uh, Lakshmi told Bhagavan Narayana, I got too tired in your previous incarnation. <laughs> I was in Janakapuri, then I had to go to Ayodhya, then I was taken to Lanka, then I had to come back, then you, I was not there again. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm just going to stay in the kingdom and I'm not going to even move. You come and get me. <laughs> so this is why Devi Rukmini is living the way she is. And who is this messenger, this Brahmana? It is Rishi <coughs> Valmiki. Rishi Valmiki was quite in tune with how much Bhagavan Rama loved Devi Sita because Devi Sita was living with him in the ashram. And he wanted to reunite her with him, him with her. But she had left her <coughs> body before that could happen. So he reincarnated to reunite them now. So it is Rishi Valmiki Ji. I'll introduce one more idea, and that will be the completion for this class. This is all preparation for the upcoming Vivaha. This is your Evite. Please come to the Vivaha. <laughs> no box gifts. <laughs> Chapter 53, verse 46. 53, 46. This is Devi Rukmini who's speaking or praying to Bhagavati Parvati. Now it's the day of the puja. She's at the mandir and she's speaking to Bhagavati Parvati. Namasye Twambike Bhikshanam Swasantan Ayutam Shivam Bhuyat Patir Me Bhagavan Krishna Stad Anumodhatam I revere you, Devi Ambika, again and again and again. And not only to you, but to your Santan to your children, and Shivam, to your husband. What am I asking for you, from you? Bhuyat, Patir me Bhagavan, be gracious that Bhagavan may be my pati, may be my husband. His name is Krishna. <laughs> She's telling Devi Parvati, his, his name is Krishna, like Devi Parvati forgot. <laughs> Anumodatam, may this please you, may this please me. So quickly, I want to read to you some thoughts in English to build up the drama. Bhagavan Krishna is sitting with this messenger and he responds to the messenger. Hearing that message of the princess of Vidharva, Krishna said smilingly to that Brahmana, holding his hand in his. Bhagavan said, I too am always thinking of her. Just as she does of me, so I do not get to sleep at night. <laughs> See, he's not writing it. He's verbalizing it. Because Valmiki Ji is the original author, correct? He's the first Gavi. I know that. Because of the opposition of Rukmi, my marriage with her has been blocked. Defeating those degenerate kings in battle, I shall take away that handsome girl. <laughs> so absorbingly in love with me, just as fire is extracted out of the fire stick in a sacrifice. Ascertaining the date fixed for Rukmini's marriage, 
Krishna ordered his charioteer, Daruka, to get his chariot ready immediately. Soon, Daruka brought the chariot, to which were harnessed the four horses, Shaibya, Sugriva, Megapushpa, and Valahaka. And they stood together before Krishna, saluting him. Together with the Brahmana messenger, Krishna ascended the chariot and thanks to the fleet-footed horses, covered the distance from Anartha country to Vidarbha in one night. For your reference, if you think of Dwaraka as being the Dwaraka in Gujarat, to go from Dwaraka to Nagpur is 25 hours by car. <laughs> And Bhagavan Krishna was able to do this in one night. Bhishmaka, that is Devi Rukmini's father, he had a sneha for his son Rukmi. Sneha means attachment, which is different than prema, which means love. Exactly like Raja Dhritarashtra. He had sneha for Duryodhana when he should have had prema. When one is attached, one is weakened and acts out of fear. So he let Rukmi decide who Devi Rukmini would be married to, and he had decided it will be Shishupala. So Rukmi and Shishupala's father. His name is Damagosha. They started preparing for their vivaha. And the scene leads us to Devi Rukmini being at the mandir of Bhagavati Parvati. And you have to imagine her like an Indian movie. She's at the steps of that altar. She's lying down like this. <laughs> and she's praying for who her husband should be. And we're going to pause there. <laughs> the scene ends. And this next scene will not be next week because of special programming, but we'll, con we'll continue <laughs> in a couple of weeks. We all get to be part of a Rakshasa Vivaha. <laughs> We've already been part of Rakshasa Vivahas. We will get to be a part of a Rakshasa Vivaha of Bhagavan and Bhagavati. Oh.